Hello everyone, we had a number of questions come in over the weekend, so I'm gonna do the best I can to answer them uh, this week. If not, then I'll try to get to them as soon as possible. But uh, we're gonna deal with, with one that I get asked quite a bit and, and have been asked this many, many times in the last 20 some odd years in the ministry. And that is, how can we prove to someone that not all paths lead to God? Um, there is the idea, of course, that everyone uh, as long as they are genuine about the path that they're on, God will accept it. So there's only one God, but many ways that lead to Him. That's, that's the typical thinking that you find um, in, in the world, I would say. You can find that everywhere. And biblically speaking, this is so easy to see in the Bible that such thinking is wrong. Uh, Jesus said, John 14, 6, a very well-known verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So right there, we, we see there's only one way to the Father. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5 also makes this clear. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Um, Peter, when he answered the, uh, uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees and the high priests and all of that in Acts chapter 4, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So Peter makes it clear, Paul makes it clear, Jesus himself made it clear. Um, I, I believe the reason that it is so clear for us is because we believe that Jesus rose again. Now if you don't believe that, and, and there are a lot of people in the world that don't, right? If you don't believe that he rose again, then it's a coin toss. Then you have just a bunch of, of prophets and men who tried to be good, who tried to explain a, a, a right way to live, and one way is as good as another. But when you want evidence for which way and which man, which prophet do we follow, well, then the resurrection clears all of that up. In Acts chapter 17, Paul was preaching to a bunch of unsaved uh, philosophers, Epicureans and Stoics, and they were the, the Athenian crowd, very well educated, and they liked to sit around and talk about all the new things and new ideas, and they had an altar set up to the unknown God, and Paul saw that as a preaching opportunity, and he stood up and he preached to them about the God that they didn't know, the God that made the heaven and the earth and made all all the nations of the world of one blood. And, and after he gets done explaining this to them, he concludes his sermon in Acts 17, 31 by saying, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. So the resurrection gives us assurance that Jesus is the chosen person, the chosen man, uh, that, and furthermore, that allows us to believe everything Jesus said about himself, uh, being God manifest in the flesh and all of that as well. But uh, the resurrection proves that Jesus is the only one that can give us life. He's the only one that can uh, speak truthfully to what happens after, after the grave. Uh, he is the one that has earned the right through living a holy, perfectly righteous life. He's earned the right to judge us. And all of that is in Paul's statement there. So when Paul was telling the Athenians that God made all nations and he made them all of one blood, and in verse 27 it says that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. So Paul made it clear that in the Old Testament, people were feeling after and seeking God the best way they could. And when you come down a couple verses more, he says, the times of this ignorance God winked at. So verse 30, Paul is recognizing that in the Old Testament, before Jesus came, we can understand why one person would say, I have my way, you have yours, and let's just do the best we can according to what we know. Uh, however, that, that time of ignorance is over. God came down to the earth, manifested himself in human form in Jesus Christ, and now that he has died and risen again, uh, the, the command is different. It, it says in verse 30, The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So yes, in the Old Testament there might have been some validity to that thinking, but not anymore. 
not since Jesus came out of the, out of the tomb. There's, there's no doubt, no room for doubt now. Uh, the, the real question, I think, uh, we have to dig a little deeper. It, it's not so much can we show from the Bible that Jesus is the only right way and there's no other way to the Father but Him. Biblically, that's fairly simple. But how do we get other people to recognize that? People that don't believe the Bible. And, and that's where you have to uh, build a person's trust and faith in the Bible. You need to show them why you believe that it is the inspired, inerrant, preserved Word of God. You need to be able to show them uh, what makes this book divine, what makes it special and stand out from all the other books. Now, that, that could be a, a separate video. As a matter of fact, I have, I've preached several sermons just to uh, bring that point out. So I know that there are hours upon hours, books upon books have been written upon this hours of preaching and teaching, so there's a lot that could be said. You can look at scientific things. You can mention how some of the biblical writers, they mentioned things that science had yet to discover, and it wouldn't have made sense to say those things when they said it. Now it seems like common knowledge, but it only took science a thousand or two thousand years to figure some of that out, uh, like the earth hanging upon nothing and being round, running water, paths in the sea, all of these type of things. Um, and I find all of that interesting. I, I have no problems mentioning that stuff. But for me, the real strength of, of the divine proof for the Bible is in its prophecy. And when these men are able to tell us about the future and in, in very intricate detail, not something vague like a war is going to happen or you know th this side is going to beat that side. That's, you got a 50-50 chance in those things. So the Bible does make those type of predictions, but it goes way beyond that. It tells us the names of kings that haven't been born yet. It, it tells us very specific things that's going to happen in a man's life, uh, sometimes over a thousand years before it comes to pass. Uh, the, the, the events listed out in Daniel chapter 11, breathtaking. The, the accuracy with which Daniel was able to prophesy there, my goodness, in Daniel 11, it's some of the most impressive stuff you'll read because Daniel's writing about what's going to happen two or three hundred years from after he's gone, and he nailed it. I mean, he explained the king of Syria and the king of Egypt and how they're going to go back and forth uh, all the way from Alexander the Great down to Antiochus Epiphanes, and he got it right. I mean, every detail. So you, you would have to take some time and show somebody why we believe so strongly that the Bible is in fact the Word of God. And then once you've established that, you can go on to talk about all these other verses that, that are very clear that Jesus is the right way. So by all means, continue to pray for your friends and ask God to touch their heart and be ready to give them an answer according to the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. If this video has helped, you can click the like button. If you'd like to follow along with our Bible Q&A blog, you can click subscribe. Feel free to leave a Bible question in the comment section below or visit us on our Facebook page, Bible Baptist Church of Pachastruam. And if you live in town, we'd like to invite you to one of our services, and we hope to see you soon. May God bless and have a great day further.